Hello, everyone. My name is Jiang Wu. I'm the director of the Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Arizona. Today, we're very happy to have Dr. John Johnston here and for an interview about his recent experience and the research. Dr. John Johnston is a senior fellow at the Center for Buddhist Studies and also a research fellow at the Tamata University at uh, uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, he is an art historian specializing in Buddhist art, especially Buddhist painting, sculpture, and material cultures. And uh, last year, actually, Dr. John Justin uh, received a grant from Japan Foundation and the Ishibashi Foundation and spent almost two months in Japan, especially as a guest monk in Mount Bokuji, uh, Wuji, Japan. And uh, today, we invited Dr. John Justin to share with us his experience and his research. And now, uh, John, welcome back. Thank you. So you have been with us for some time and we got into this project and you you have been such a tremendous uh, contributor to our online exhibition, Oba Kuyingen online exhibition at ingen.arizona.edu. The reason for organizing such a online exhibition, as you know, is for celebrating Master Ian Longqi's 350th uh, death anniversary, right? And uh, throughout this time period, you have done lots of research and recently just uh, spent time in Japan, right? And before we get into your uh, Japan experience, so, so can you give us a little bit of uh, background information about yourself, how, how you get such long journey, right? So at this point and working on the Obaku Art and ex Exhibition. Well, thank you, and it's a delight to be back in Tucson, and I've had a wonderful experience thanks to the University of Arizona Center for Buddhist Studies in Japan. I've been involved in the study of Buddhist art history for many years now. It began with an interest in Chinese Buddhist art, so I spent time in China doing research on the topic, and over the years, I've also spent time in the Himalayas in Bhutan and in Thailand and Southeast Asia. So my interest in Buddhist art is pretty broad. I'm particularly interested in how Buddhist art is used in Buddhist practice. And in addition to my interest in Buddhist art, I'm also a specialist in ceramics and other areas of Asian art. Yeah, that's great. That's quite an experience. Yeah. And uh, I still remember about two or three years when we first met, and uh, you know nothing about Obaku. That is true. <laughs> is that true? Yes. And we met at the Whole Foods, right? So if you remember, so we had the coffee together and to show you some of the oh, that's right. yes. materials about the whole back. So, so from that point, you have a zero knowledge about this tradition. And right now, you, you know tons of uh, uh, things and you have the personal experience in the monastery. And, and uh, what, what, what's the change? What, what actually transformed you? Well, having a knowledge of Chinese history and Chinese Buddhist art helps with connecting with the Obaku tradition. Because as you know, perhaps better than anyone, that Obaku is very much a late Ming Chinese Buddhist culture. Yes. And so many of the practices, even to this day at Mount Pukuji, reflect the Chinese heritage of Obaku. So I will admit I knew nothing about Obaku. And I think Obaku tends to be a fairly obscure topic in Buddhist studies in general. But being able to bring Chinese studies and an understanding of Chinese history and art history really helped me connect with the Obaku tradition. So, you know, Obaku is these days a living tradition. So I was very interested in going to Japan to see what's going on with Obaku today. Not so much with what was going on with Obaku during the formative period in the 17th century. So that uh, was one of the motivations for taking this interest to Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, then the, let's talk about your, your monastic experience, right? So you, you were a uh, guest monk, right? You really, you were accepted into the monastic community, right? Doing uh, 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 rituals and, and also the daily uh, liturgical kind of a morning and the evening sessions, right? So this is why, why not you, you talk about your experience? How, how, how you know, 
this is very unique, right? So not, not every ordinary person can, can be admitted into this community. And you are so fortunate, right? To have the firsthand experience. So, so let, let's talk about that. Well, yes, it was a great privilege and really an honor to be able to serve as a guest monk at Mampukaji. I was not a real monk, and occasionally the monks at Mampukaji would remind me, you're not a real monk. I didn't uh, ordain and I didn't take vows, but I did try to conform to monastic life as best I could. And they did, um, they were very generous in allowing me to stay overnight in the monastic, in the monks' quarters. And they included me in almost all the rituals, including the morning rituals. So this getting up at four in the morning and doing various morning duties and then chanting, usually at 5 a.m. And that would last for about an hour. And then a meditation session again for about an hour from six to seven. And then there would be some um, yard work and various duties and then breakfast. And all of this was with the monks, especially the three monks in training that I was with in that training area of the Mampukaji campus. And then during the day, I would conduct my research in art history at the Bunkaden, the cultural treasury. And I had my own academic research. And then, yes, in the evening, I would rejoin the monks and we would have uh, meditation and chanting. So, yeah, it was really important for me to be able to go behind the scenes and see what Obaku culture is like from a more monastic perspective. Yeah. So it's a full schedule. It was a job. <laughs> yes, and it's one thing that I took from my experience is that it's a very demanding lifestyle. The monks work hard, particularly the monks who were in training. So the monks who I was with, there were three monks in the program, and they stay at Mampukaji for, for one to three years until they complete their ordination and then they're qualified to become an abbot of any Obaku temple in Japan. So the director of education, an, another monk, he decides when you're ready, when your program is finished. So that's why it's one to three years. But it, I mean, I got off easy because I was a researcher and I was a foreigner, so I didn't have to do all of the rigorous work, but I watched these monks really put in, as you say, full days and long days, and they were really dedicated to their training. So here we're talking about ritual, right, and meditation, labor, research. Uh, so, but Obaku also uh, is one of the Zen tradition. Right, and so, so where is the Zen part? So according to your understanding. I think the Zen part is throughout the experience. I think Zen is interwoven with Obaku. And sometimes, especially critics, critics of the Obaku school tend to say, well, maybe it's not really Zen because they do this chanting and they have this uh, reverence for Amitabha and Guan Yin and perhaps it's not pure Zen, but that was not my experience. I think the emphasis is on meditation and uh, quiet reflection, introspection. So th as meditation is sort of the core practice, that's very Zen. And the chanting itself is not as devotional as I would have expected. It's not like Jodo Shinshu or some of the Pure Land schools that I associate chanting with. I think the chanting goes hand in hand with the meditation practice. So the chanting in the mornings leads up to the meditation. And then in the evenings, there's meditation first and then the chanting to conclude the day. One thing that really struck me about Mampukaji is the use of sacred sounds. So that's uh, something that most visitors don't get to see because it happens generally very early in the morning and in the evening after the main gate is closed. But there's a, a lot of sacred sounds, drums, chimes, gongs. There's a whole variety of sounds and chanting and also call and response instruments. So 
a drum will be hit on one side of the monastery and then a bell will ring and correspond to that on the other side. So yeah, the sacred sounds are an important part of Obaku and some suggest that this importance of the sacred sound is related to Shingon or more esoteric practices. But to answer your question, I feel that Obaku, at least as how it's experienced today, is very much a Zen tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's great. Uh, so, and also we know this tradition was founded by a Chinese monk, right? So Yi Yuan Longqi went to Japan in 1654, and Mount Bubuji was built in 1661. Yes. And uh, so according to historical records, he uh, just transported lots of the Chinese practice, including the liturgical texts, for example, yeah. uh, into Japan. And, and, the, and right now, almost uh, 400 years already passed. And uh, how, how much right now that today's Mount Bukuji, Japanese Obaku practice tradition uh, uh, kind of a, uh, connect to this Chinese heritage? And can you see in the monastery in the daily practice, for example, chanting? So I was told they still chanting Ming, Ming Dynasty style <laughs> Chinese, all right? It's pronunciation. Uh, uh, so so, so what, what, how to make sense? How, how they make sense of their tradition as a, the latest one coming from uh, China. I think a lot of the Chinese customs are maintained. It tends to be a fairly conservative religious culture, and I think that they have uh, very consciously followed the first generation of Ingen and Mokowan and the first patriarchs during the 17th century. And for the first hundred years, of Mount Pukuji, all of the abbots were Chinese. So this helped preserve this Chinese culture. In terms of the chanting, yes, it's in Chinese, but it's sort of in a quasi-Chinese. It's not, a, if you know Mandarin, it doesn't exactly follow Mandarin or Putonghua. It's said to be a Nanjing dialect yes. from the Ming dynasty, but it's not tonal, so they don't chant with the tones, which is different. So I could follow the the um, scripts, but the sounds were different than I expected. And they, that is one example of preserving Chinese customs, is that all of the important Obaku texts are in classical Chinese, and the chanting is in Chinese. And a lot of the furnishings are original in Manpukuji, the sculptures and, the, as I mentioned, the musical instruments. Uh, so that it has a very Chinese feeling. It feels like you're stepping into a late Ming Chinese Buddhist atmosphere. But over the last many centuries, there has been a Japanification. There are aspects of Japanese culture and Japanese religious life that have been incorporated into Obaku. So um, early Obaku, the monks didn't shave their heads bald that you see in portraits of Ingen and the early monks that they had different kinds of hairstyles. And now the monks shave their heads completely bald, as an example. Another is that um, the Chinese monks wore shoes. And now the Obaku monks all wear sandals, which is a more Japanese custom. So there are Japanese aspects. I would say also, and of course I don't know exactly how Obaku was practiced in the first generations, but today it's a very rigid program of training and highly disciplined. And I would tend to think that that may be an influence of Japanese Zen cultures. Yes, yes. And also you have a mission in Mount Pukuchi, right? Which is to start a their art. Yes. So and and there there are different kinds of calligraphies and also your interest in sculpture, for example, right? That's right. So so any amazing sculptures, uh, something strikes us as really valuable in your research. Well, there's there's so much wonderful art associated with the Obaku school in general and in Mampukuji specifically. Mampukuji is home to the Bunkaden, the cultural treasury for the entire Obaku school. So it's a repository of important texts, amazing works of calligraphy and painting and sculpture. But it's unlikely when you visit Mampukuji that you'll see painting and 
calligraphy outside of their small museum that's near the Bunkaden. But inside the temples, what you see is uh, mainly the calligraphic signboards, the wooden carved calligraphy, and sculpture. So those are things that are accessible to all visitors of Mampukaji. And to my mind, the greatest sculptor of the Obaku tradition is Fan Daosham, or Han Dose in Japanese. And he came to um, Japan starting in Nagasaki just after Ingen arrived. And eventually Ingen invited him to Mampukuji and Fan Daosheng made over 25 sculptures for Mampukuji, including the 18 Arhats, which is one of the most famous set of Arhat sculptures in Japan, if not in the world. And Fan is a really a fascinating figure to me. He came to Japan at just the age of 26 and was incredibly productive in his four years in Japan. And tragically, he died at the age of 35. So he had a very short career as an artist, but was not only a great sculptor, but also a great painter. So yeah, I was really impressed with the sculptures and with the work of Fan Daosheng. And also, um, being in the Bunkaden, I had an opportunity to see paintings, including paintings by major figures like Ito Jakuchu and others, Kak Kakute, and the quality of painting also really was amazing to me. It does amaze me. So the visual culture, the material culture, the art history of the Obaku school is really one of its most outstanding contributions. Yeah. And this afternoon, you're going to give us a lecture, right? So this is going to be part of your lecture? Yes. So today I will give a lecture about Monpukuji and take the audience through the main temples and show them the sculptures and why the sculptures are important, how they reflect Ming Dynasty style. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And also this is related to our uh, online art exhibition. So we have been working on this project so hard. And right now you'll come, from, come back from Japan and I know there's going to be a major update, right? Yes. So can you... Tell us, tell our audience what, what exactly those uh, updates. Oh, sure. We're very excited about the updates to the True Image online exhibition celebrating the life of Ingen and the contributions of the Obaku School. We started with about 30 works from major Western museums, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Cleveland Museum of Art, so many museums that have just outstanding Asian art collections. So to begin that project, we looked, we, our theme was to focus on Obaku works in Western collections. So we went methodically through all the great museums looking for Obaku pieces. And we have an extraordinary exhibition committee with some of the greatest scholars in this area. So everyone knew of a great painting or wonderful work of calligraphy or sculpture that they could recommend. So in the genesis of the show, we began to hear about these great works and seek permission to include them into the online exhibition. Now we're updating it with private material from two um, private collections belonging to Dr. Harold Conrad and Dr. Stuart Katz. And these two private collections almost double the selections that we will have online. So we will have about 60 works of art. And they cover many different subjects and uh, modes of expression. So we have calligraphy and figural painting, landscape painting, sculpture, uh, woodblock prints. And they're arranged in thematic rooms. And another main update that we've done is we've added explanatory descriptions to a number of the pieces to help visitors to the exhibition so that they can see a work of art and then they can, we provide a few sentences to help them connect more deeply with what's on view. Yeah, this is indeed a, a great achievement. Oh, yes. Um, uh, Dr. Patricia Graham and Dr. Elizabeth Horton really did a lot of serious scholarship and put in hundreds of hours into making this a remarkable 
online experience. So I think it's a very important contribution to the study of Obaku Arns. Yeah, yeah. It really uh, reflects the uh, time period, right? So uh, when those uh, art objects were created. So, and also in your research in Japan, not only you stayed in Mount Fuji, uh, Kyoto for, for quite a long time, you also went to Nagasaki, which is a, a, another different place, right? So very, very exotic, very interesting. So, so any revelation coming from that experience? Well, I highly recommend a visit to Nagasaki for anyone interested in the Obaku School. As you know, the earliest decades of what would become the Obaku School again in Nagasaki. So Ingen and his followers and other major figures who came from Fujian province to Japan began their experience in Nagasaki. And there are still several very important Chinese temples in Nagasaki where Ingen stayed and where Fan Daosheng, the sculptor that I mentioned, he also stayed in Nagasaki and made work in Nagasaki. So yes, I think that going to Nagasaki helps you better understand Mount Fukuji. And I'm particularly fond of Ko Fukuji Temple, which is the first Chinese temple. I think it dates to the, around 1626. And you see elements of Ko Fukuji that are, that are carried out also in Mount Fukuji, like the use of the uh, fish drum and the sculptures of what are considered maybe Chinese popular figures or Taoist figures, like Hua Guang Da Di, yes, yes. and Fujian. Yeah, from Fujian, and Matsu, and Guang Di. You see all of this in the visual culture of Kofukuji, and you can also find this in Mount Fukuji. Yeah, so I'm very impressed with the Chinese temples in Nagasaki, and I think they've done an excellent job of preserving this early 17th century kind of uh, Ming culture. So that's a wonderful experience. So I know you're going to continue doing research, right, it's about Obaku and all the uh, traditions in Japan and China. And I know you're on your way actually to Thailand. So go back to the Tamathat University as a research scholar. Uh, can you tell us more about your fu future research, the trajectory of your <laughs> future? Well, I have two major projects, and they're very different. So when I get tired of one, I can always go to the other and vice versa. And in addition to the Obaku studies, which I do hope to continue with, particularly on the question of sculpture and Obaku sculpture's connection to Ming sculpture and the life of Fang Daosheng, that's one area. And in Thailand, I look at the environmental sustainability of Buddhist material culture. And I work with a co-researcher, and I'm very happy to be a part of Pretty Banam Myung International College, which is a part of Thammasat University. And we're looking at things like, how is the material culture of Buddhism today in Thailand sustainable or not sustainable environmentally? So we look at the use of plastics and non-renewable materials in uh, Buddhist and various Buddhist rituals. And we look at how the Buddhist community is responding to the environmental crisis. So we see, for example, a monastery in Bangkok that is using plastic water bottles and recycling them and making Buddhist robes, monks' robes, and also the use of plastics to make, uh, recycle plastics to make amulets protective Buddhist amulets. And also how Buddhist thought leaders in Thailand are responding to this environmental crisis and what they suggest in terms of moving forward, how the Buddhist community can be res responsibly engaged with uh, the environmental issues. So you can see it's quite a difference from my other research, but both of them I find really fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is very contemporary, and uh, you you bridge the past and the <laughs> right now, contemporary the present very well. Yeah. Thank you. And I I do see a connection with my work in Monpukuji because I was looking at how Obaku is practiced today as a living tradition in contemporary Buddhism, and then in Thailand I'm looking at how 
the Buddhist community is responding to environmental issues, which is also very contemporary, and how they um, put concepts into practice. Yeah, that's great, yeah. So now we come to the end of our interview. At the end of the interview, I always ask uh, the, the question, uh, my question, right? So to the guest, uh, so I'm, I'm writing the book. So I have been saying this for a long time, uh, how Buddhism changed the world civilization, right? So think about that. This, this is a very big topic. And people responded uh, differently, yeah? So I would like to ask every guest I uh, interviewed, so what do you think, right? So if I ask you uh, how Buddhism, how, how did Buddhism change world civilization or is changing or maybe not at all? Uh, so considering Obakuard, for example, right? Uh, so I don't know what, what's your response going to be. No, it's such a big question. It's a hard one to answer. I think Buddhism has had a profound influence in areas like, of course, religious studies and philosophy, East and West around the world. Uh, in Asian art, it's hard to imagine Asian art without Buddhism, particularly Buddhist figural representation that began 600 years after the life of the Buddha. So once you pass the an iconic stage for uh, the last over 2,000 years, figural sculpture and figural painting has been very important. But I would say the influence of Buddhism in world civilizations also is an individual experience. It's person by person. So that individuals experience Buddhism, they practice Buddhism, it changes the way they see themselves and their connection to their communities and their behavior, their conduct, and their aspirations. So that even though there's been a massive influence in Buddhism over the centuries and millennia all over the world, all of these changes begin with individuals and the power that Buddhism has to change a perspective person by person. This is very important to bring in the personal dimension. So I think I, I'm going to write this into my book. <laughs> I'm going to code you. <laughs> yes, please put a footnote there. Okay, yes, yeah, is great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, John Johnston. Um, I also I want to say to our audience, on behalf of our community, on behalf of the uh, Center for Buddhist Studies, I uh, want to thank Dr. John Johnston for your contribution to our center's mission to the Obaku in-game online exhibition. And uh, we wish you well in your future research. Uh, have a great journey to Thailand. Thank yeah. you. Thank you thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you.